This is going to save you from kicking and screaming. Basically, you're going to just tear a rag is what I do about halfway down. So that's nice, goes all the way down, exposing the exhaust port all the way. Back to the garage, we are in the bike corner today. We have a box from Millennium Technologies. They are your cylinder solution. They actually have a cylinder exchange program. So they can send one out, you don't have to wait. We get a new cylinder right away. And then we're gonna go ahead and take our head studs, our power valve, etc., off of our old one, put it on the new one, and then ship out our original cylinder that we had on the bike and they're gonna machine it and then send it to someone else to keep that exchange program moving forward. So it's a super cool setup. We'll have their information in the description. So let's go ahead and open this box and check out this new cylinder and get switching everything over. We got a nice fresh cylinder, silky smooth. Everything is in good shape. Gonna take our reeds off. We're gonna take our head studs off. Power valve over here. Before we start working on that cylinder, more dirt bike parts just showed up for the motor. Big shout out to our peeps at ProX. We have some new motor parts. I'll have a link in the description to all these as well. This is a connecting rod for our crank. When we have it rebuilt, we can toss this guy in there. We know she's straight. We know she's strong. Be a good addition to it. We also have the crankshaft bearing and seal kit for this bike that I'm gonna give to the shop. Normally you can just buy this through Crankworks, but I uh, went ahead and ordered this ahead of time. Everything we need, the big bearings inside that are pretty heavy. Um, they look just like they do on the package. And we got our seal. Super pumped. And we have our gasket set. Looks like this is everything we need for rebuilding it and having all of our gaskets. And this is also through ProX. I'm sitting here editing this. Just for the record, I was clueless at this point in the video. And how much I know now, by the time you guys are seeing this, I just, this is insane. So if you guys ever have any questions about going out there and doing this stuff yourself, it sucks at first, but like, to think that I, how much I didn't know before, <laughs> I can't believe I questioned it. It was so worth it. And I encourage you to watch this whole entire video because you will know that much by the end of this. That gaskets kit is for the whole entire motor. You'll know where everything goes, etc. This is about to, you're about to embark on some serious knowledge. Sit back and get ready to retain. Taking apart the power valve now or exhaust valve, taking off the cover. And then inside the cover is just a bunch of pieces that you don't know what you're looking at. So then you have the cover, it's full of carbon. This is a messy job. Um, I'm gonna pull off the spring for the exhaust pipe right there. And then we're gonna take off the two side covers that are also for the exhaust slash power valve. Um, these little have little caps that you pull out. Um, super simple deal. They have a screw that holds them in place, two screws. We're taking off the reeds right now while we're at it because I was all over the place, didn't know what I was doing. So we got that cover off for the carburetor. Then we take our reeds out, which were broken. We fix later. Um, we replace them with some carbon ones. And then inside here, we're taking off the other side. There's a left and right side. Now these caps have an L and an R, so you know which side they go on. And when you put it back together, you do it right. And then once we get up in here, there's um, some points of it that are uh, you would use a Allen wrench. And then you have to pry it back a little bit and get your Allen wrench in there. Lots of learning going on here. The best thing you can do um, to help you in this situation like me is to go to Rocky Mountain ATV MC, go to their OEM parts tab, and then type in your bike and you can go to the power valve or exhaust valve, however it's labeled, and look at how it all goes together. Um, I just kind of winged it. There's a rod that slides through this whole thing. This is actually one of the simpler models. In 2003, this got a lot more complex, so I'm glad I got this bike for being the first time. Um, I wish I could go into more detail, but the next bike we will show exactly um, you know, what's going on in the power valve. And don't worry, I ended up cleaning the power valve later. I didn't put it all back all in dirty. I just wanted to put it back together 
even though it was dirty to make sure I had everything put back right and I could transfer it all over so I could send this cylinder back. Power valve is finished, now back to the old cylinder. We're gonna go ahead and use two nuts on each head stud to get them off. You pretty much tighten them together and then you can grab the bottom one and twist it off, no problem. I'm using a torque wrench for some leverage and then installing them into the new cylinder at about 20 foot pounds of torque. You can look in the manual for the spec, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Like I said, this is the first time I've ever done this. I'm still learning but everything's double checked at the end with Joe, who you're about to see soon, build the whole engine and show us what's good. I need to get the head studs out of the cylinder. So I have the head bolt and I'm gonna go and see what size this is. Oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. I look right past it. it happens every time. We have our next package, part of the motor components. This is the piston kit. Last piece to the puzzle before we get our fat head, but at least we can get this thing running and then do all the mods later. This is a Wiseco piston kit for our arm 250. This is a 2000 to 2002. Here are our two rings. Oh, this is cool. It comes in a little case. What is this, like a jewelry situation? Oh wow, that's sick. Super nice. We have our clips for our wrist pin. In the package we have our wrist pin here. Our rings. And we have our installation instructions. Fully rebuilt crank with a new rod from Crankworks in Tempe. Luckily they're local, so I was able to just drop it off, pick it up about a week later. Super rad guys there, I highly recommend them. I'll have their information in the description so you can get your crank sent off to them. Even if you're out of state, they are the go-to people for having your crank rebuilt and done right. So we measure main bearing press fit on both ends. We also measure the pin bore and the pin to see if there's any scoring, pitting, and if there is, we highly recommend replacing it. Today we are Mesa putting the RM250 motor back together now. I wanted to learn this whole process and do it myself from the ground up, but with the two cars going on and moving so fast, and we, all, we have a kind of a short winter here in Phoenix, and it gets so flipping hot. I want to have plenty of riding time with my dad and stuff like that. So I was like, ah, oh, dude, like to just do this motor right. And like, what if I put it together and then it breaks after like two rides and then I'm going to be out and then it's going to be summer. It's, I don't want to mess with it. So I met this guy named Joe at Crankworks and he was super duper helpful. And so we we're getting chat. I was like, hey, you know, do you do, a, you know, bike side, you know, side work to put bikes together? And he's like, yeah, all the time, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, hey, can you help me put this motor back together? So I know I do it right. And then in the summer, we can take it apart and learn these things from the ground up. And then maybe I can watch how Joe does it in person because it's just better to watch first. And I don't want to dive and have problems. So we're at Joe's house right now. I'm going to introduce you to him. Sec, he has a cool little garage. He's totally dialed for moto stuff. So this is his cool garage in here. Joe, what's going on? Well, you know, just, uh, Working away on bikes. What uh? What should we? What are we look, working with here? You got everything laid out. You're kind of seeing what I have, what I don't. It's dirty. You, I know we didn't want to do things dirty, but we're in a rush, so yeah. I wanted to acknowledge that. But because uh, <coughs> Joe does crazy work, like you look at everything over here. He's got full build. He's got a carburetor, every single piece of part. He's got a flat track build right here. He's got his Cali right there. I don't know, Joe. Tell us anything you want to. 
Anything we should know about your bike history? Um, well, you know, just... Who you uh, are, how long you've been in it, your whole life? Yeah, my whole life, just growing up with, um, you know, uh, moved out here, went to MMI, uh, did the whole training program with uh, Motorcycle Mechanics Institution, um, interned for some uh, local race teams, and uh, yeah, the rest is uh, history, just worked at Crankworks, and uh, just worked on dirt bikes on my own my whole career pretty much so but yeah right now we're just kind of doing a visual inspection on what you got here um just because we bought you bought this used you know you don't really know um what you got just looking at the cases making sure there's no cracks um being a two-stroke you don't want to have any lean issues burning up the crank or anything like that so yeah just right now just kind of visually inspecting everything and see what we got and go from there that all these gears basically line up with no binding issues so that's what we're seeing right now that looks good so then just visually looking at them too I want to make sure nothing went through the transmission like we don't have a little nick or anything like that make sure that the dogs are engaging and that those aren't rounded off that'll cause some gear slippage there that looks pretty good actually rule of thumb if one is damaged usually the corresponding gear is going to be damaged as well um, they usually wear in sets most of the time. Sometimes you can get lucky. So if you ever see one that's damaged, always found the counter acting gear. So this is your main shaft here, and this is your counter shaft. Main shaft drives the clutch, which this is the clutch side that drives the transmission. And then you have the output side. This is the sprocket, uh, or your counter shaft here. This is the side where the chain rides. Okay. So... That's like your C1s and your M1s, 2, 3, 4, 5. I always take a picture for ref. I'm going to take one from both sides. I'm going to take one from this side here, on this case here, and I'm going to flip it and do the same thing. And the reason I'm doing this is just in case bearings are orientated certain ways. Seals are oriented certain ways. See how the lip is facing outward? Mm -hmm. You could flip that and that would be bad. Oh, okay. It'll still go in. So you, you want to just make sure everything goes back another rule of thumb i usually do too is it's good not to pull that stuff out and clean it and not put it in the same day you don't want to pull this stuff out without taking a picture clean it and then come back in a week when you have free time and then all of a sudden you're like crap which way did that go you know right so i like to do it right away if i'm going to pull it we're going to do it that same day just so it's done right then we're not running into any what ifs clean these up prize right out of there so again, that was facing this way. We already took a picture of that, but hmm. we just want to make sure. And then we're going to grab this main seal here too. It's important not to get too deep and gouge the side where the seal presses in this area. Uh -huh. You don't want to gouge that. Is that like a seal puller specialized tool? Yeah, this is uh, just a seal puller. I think, I'm not sure who makes this. It might be a tusk or something you can get on RockyMountainATVMC.com or... Next is, these little baggies are a lifesaver. You have a whole bunch of them that you already bagged up, so I'm sure you're aware. This is your right case, because you can set it up. This is the way it's gonna be in the motor. Just like that. So you got left, right. So when you're taking the stuff off there, I always like to just put it in here. So when I put the new stuff in, I can count the old stuff. Uh. And just reassure that I'm putting the right amount of hardware I'm taking off that case back on but then if I have to go back for any reason it's in there so yeah you got some debris in there there's like some metal in here and stuff it's kind of scary oh because the bearings yeah stuff. you don't want it traveling through there you know like that's the thing is we'll have to spray all those out real good Torco assembly with this stuff's gold so I build all my engines with that so these are a bearing driver or seal driver tool it can be used for installing or removing. So basically you have different sizes and they fit corresponding bearing sizes. So in this case, um, I don't have a press that I would typically use just to press this out. So um, we're just gonna hammer it out of here. So first thing, on two strokes they don't have clips, like a four stroke they'll probably have like a clip in here that'll hold this bearing. So you always wanna make sure there's nothing holding the bearing. So in this case, we're just going to grab this, and I'm going to grab a dead blow and hit it out of there. And the dead blow is not going to give it enough meat. It's almost out of there. I'm a really stubborn one. There it goes. So that looks good. There's no damage around there. Is that something that you were starting to heat up to get out? 
Um, you could heat it up. What, There's really no. What point. were the ones you were telling me to heat up? These ones. Oh, that's what we're gonna do when we install it. Oh, install it. Got install it. it. So. When we do that, um, driving them out is not a big deal because we just put a crazy load on this, but this is an old bearing. We don't need it. Nothing holding that, no retaining clips or bolts. But again, being a two-stroke, there shouldn't be on this model. So in this case, I don't have nothing to get in there that small, so I'm going to have to rig something up. Automotive socket. Good idea. Let's see if I find the bigger ones, it's better. Nice. And I can just hold it. These things are really in there. I could probably add a little heat to it, it won't hurt. So if they get really cold like it is right now, which is crazy here, it'll shrink mm. and just give it more press. So. I'm getting a lot of vibration. This takes a little persuasion sometimes. Looks very violent, but it'll be fine. Again, if I had to press, it'd been a lot smoother pressing that out of there. But yeah, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yep. So that's the main thing you want to replace for sure. If anything, is your main bearings and your main seals. Because you don't want that leaning out and taking out the crank. What do you mean by lean out? If it's the seal's ruptured or damaged or anything there, it'll actually induce air into the crankcase area. Mm. And air will lean out the mixture more and it'll uh, it'll burn up the bearing on the bottom end. Looks like it. Pretty good. I always check inside here because you can always tell history on a motor. Like if uh, he had a crank failure before that one locked up, it might chew up the case. In this case, the case looks pretty good. I don't see any repairs done or any signs of sig major catastrophic failure. It looks like uh, it just locked up on him, the previous crank. Yeah. And it didn't like throw the rod or something or drop a piston skirt down in the bottom and chew up everything. That's when it gets scary because then you got to repair the cases and... If they're warped and they're not square, they could weep and leak. There's mm. a lot of little things I look for when I personally go and buy a used motorcycle. Like if it's in parts, I've seen plenty of them where guys will rip them apart and then they're just like give up on the project because it's just overwhelming, you know. They're like there's so many pieces and so much stuff. And then you think you're getting a good deal because you're buying it for $500 until you realize you need a $2,000 head for a four-stroke or you need a new set of cases and, you know, it starts adding up real quick, so. Yeah, this one feels notchy. This one's got either debris or it's got a bad bearing. Hopefully it's not a bad bearing because then we'll have to replace it. It's feeling pretty poor. But it. Yeah, I can. I can just hear it. That's a bummer. Well, actually, it feels better now. Maybe it was just in there crooked or something. Basically, just checking the inner race and the bottom race to make sure there's no pitting. And they look good. Hmm. We got lucky, maybe? Yeah, I think so. It's spinning pretty nice to me. And then once you put some assembly lube on there, it should be good. So it could have had just some residual debris because there's a lot of dirt and grime and stuff in here um, that we need to basically spray out real good and make sure um, none of that gets into any of the new stuff we're putting in, like the crank and these bearings and so forth. So all this stuff needs to be just cleaned really well. So another little misleading uh, trick that people always say is to freeze the bearing and heat the case. You know, you can freeze the bearing to shrink it and heat the case and have it drop in, but I don't like that. The reason I don't like that is because it creates condensation when you have heat and cold. Condensation creates rust. This is steel. So you either do one of the two, you either heat it up or you cool or you cool it. 
I don't like cooling it again just because it freezes and it creates frost and then it melts and then it creates rust and then you're bearing rust in your case and you can't get it out. So what we're going to do is we're just going to heat this up and drop it in. So that's what we're going to do real quick on this. And then another thing I like to do on this is I also direction my bearing. Um, this is just a pet peeve that I have, but I always put the manufacturer of the Koyo facing up. The reason I do that is because if you pull this apart and this is now like this, it's telling me the bearing's spinning in the cases and you have a case fitting oh. issue. So there's actually a purpose for it. It's like I, a lug nut deal to know if they're coming loose. Yeah, and right. you can do it either way. You could put it in there, you could paint marker it, oh. put the bearing in the case and see if it turns. Mm. For me, when I build motors, especially if I go into a repeating customer's motor or a, you know, if he's getting it service frequently, that's something I'd look for and then I know if it's wearing or not. But you don't want to drive in a bearing um, with basically a, a press or a hammer like we took those out. Um, that, those are bad bearings, so we could beat on them like that and get away with it. Right. Because we're not reusing it. Absolutely. Then another thing, too, is you don't want the main seal in on here right now. Um, I'm using a butane torch right now because the seal's not back there. I don't have to worry about melting it. Now, if you had to reuse that seal and you didn't want to pull it out of there, you can use a conventional heat gun, which I also have. So I can do it both methods. I can show you this way, and I can show you with a, a heat gun as well. Because not a lot of people probably have a butane torch. A heat gun you can get for like 10 bucks. You know, this is probably like 40 bucks or something for a, a rig. But this heats up a lot nicer than a heat gun. Another thing too is when you think you got it hot enough, go another two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> just just for the fact that uh, if it gets stuck in there halfway, now you're driving it back out, you know, mm -hmm. and now you're putting a load on it. Um, so uh, you definitely want it to drop all the way in. And the nice thing about doing this is it seats all the way down. You don't have to worry about hitting it and setting the bearing. So you're not putting any residual load on the main bearing, and that's important. Um, the nice thing we got going on right now, too, is it's like, what, 50, 60 degrees out? This bearing's kind of cold, um, uh, so it's going to already be a little bit smaller in diameter. We're talking tens of thousands, probably, but every little bit counts because there's only so much press fit here. You know, there's probably only about a thou press fit on this case for this bearing. So, so that being said, we'll just heat this up, and then we're going to do the same thing with this bearing, too. We're going to heat this up, and we're going to heat this one up as well. I feel like we're good, so I'm going to go another two minutes. <laughs> Just to make sure, man, because I really don't want to drive this bearing in. And sometimes you don't have a choice. Like, if it goes in and it gets stuck, I'll have to take that bearing driver and just set it, you know. i to test fit this with our hand first. Just using my fingers, it should drop right in. That. Nice. That's awesome. So you could hear it click when it dropped in so I know it's seated all the way so now we just let that cool by itself there and then uh, we can do the same thing with the other one except I'm gonna convert over to another method so now we're gonna use the heat gun this is just a cheap Harbor Freight I think they're like 12 bucks worth their weight in gold <laughs> seals or a bearing that's sealed sometimes you might have a sealed bearing this is going to be a lot more friendlier than the fire so the heat gun it takes a little longer for the heat gun in some cases but uh just another way of doing it so you see we don't have to do bearings we don't have to do both those things because now we're just adding elements into you know the motor that we don't need we don't need to risk locking them in there and and they'll drop in fine it's when you take them out the next time you have to build it that's when you're going to run into issues with my finger actually i'm going to press it so it holds in there and i'm actually going to line it up like so and wiggle it and it's going in i'm just going to push it down 
This one I didn't get to line up straight like I wanted, but it went in, so I just pushed it in. Nice. So if anything, I'll just paint marker it or something here. But yeah, that went in real nice, and now it spins like nothing. Once you add a little bit of lube in there, which this is down the road, but you can just hear how dry it is. It's just a dry bearing right now, but if I throw a little bit of that in there while it's hot. Smooth is better. Yep, like brand new. And we'll do that to all these bearings. We're going to go and put lube, assembly lube in all of them. So we don't have any type of dry seizure or anything like that. Mm -hmm. so let me get this prepared before I start heating. And what I should do also is get the driver ready just in case. Because you never know. Heat, because this doesn't heat up as hot as the... Uh, the torch. So if I don't get this hot enough, it might just need a little persu persuasion to get it in there. But just in case, that will be on standby. You saw how hard it was to drive out there. It was really pressed in there. So yeah. this, these cases have really good press fit. Nice. Like butter. That's the way it should be. Try to keep that heat uniform as much as possible. What's the next step after we get these bearings in? Uh, I'll put all the seals in. I'll probably wash out uh, anything that was left in the case. I think I got it pretty much cleaned out for the most part. Um, put all the seals in. And then... Uh, start putting the parts in so we're putting the crank in and the transmission and everything else so basically we're just doing all the prep work with all the new parts this is the first part you got to start with so um just make sure all the bearings are good and everything because there's no sense in putting in the tranny and everything if you got a bad part you know um so we just got to go through and make sure everything is good to go before we start putting stuff in so yeah we'll put the last bearing in that's all the bearings and then uh or replace all the seals I pulled out and then uh, we'll drop the tranny in put the crank in and then this model I have to see if it takes a center gasket I think it does because I pulled one off so yeah with this gun it just takes a little longer in my opinion to heat up the case but this is a safer alternative um, having a backing too is very important because that will work off so I put this backing on it. You can pick this up on like Walmart for like 15 bucks, man. It's a lifesaver. And it also makes clean up a breeze too. If I spill oil True. and stuff, you know, True. it Good all call. stays on the case and stuff. Absolutely. So these motors get messy. This is typically my teardown. This is not my assembly area. I like to keep my assembly area like super clean. Um, kind of like a doctor's office or a dentist's office, you know. Um, basically, I treat it like surgery. So. All right, well... I'm going to position this, and I got the driver on standby just in case. I'm going to drop that. Boom. Boom. Just like that. That's how it's done. She's hot. So we're going to let that cool now. We'll get that back down to temperature and room temperature, I should say, and go from there. Here. This came in that bearing kit, so we're going to go ahead and use those instead of the ones that were in that kit, which either way, it doesn't really matter. But this was down, if you recall from our picture, this was in like so, that way. You can also see the lip faces outwards, so when the, the shaft of the crankshaft pulls through, it'll actually push against that and spread correctly, so... We just want to install that one in there like so. Do that, I'm going to have to get more gloves and I'm going to have to get some grease. And what I do is I grease the inside of the lip and I also put a little grease on the outside. Now you can drive these in or you can kind of press them in. I'm going to see if I can do it both ways to kind of show you them. Oh, I set this up so I'll just take a little bit of grease here and get it right inside the lip. Like so. And I'll throw a little bit around the outside of this. So then we get a nice grease seal. 
And then that'll go in like so. And I'm gonna use my thumbs right now and just push this in like that. And basically, I'm using my thumb to push against the edge of the seal. See how it rides right against the edge? An important thing on this is you don't want to drive the seal so far that it hits the bearing. The bearing will spin against the seal and it'll actually burn the seal up. So you want to make sure you don't go too far. I could press this in a lot deeper, but... You want to just have it to the edge? Yep, just like that. And that's installed. So we won't need the physical driver. If you couldn't get it in, you could also use this driver and you'd hit it. And just ensure, just give it like a little love tap. And it's got a solid noise. It means I'm hitting against the case here. Like before it would be like nothing and then all of a sudden you hear wham. Makes sense. So that just ensures it's seating all the way because you don't want the bearing rubbing it and then you also don't want the stator assembly rubbing against that either. So essentially that one is done. And then we'll do the same thing with these ones here. This looks pretty dirty inside here. So we're just gonna clean that out real quick. Just use some brake cleaner or contact cleaner get in there and kind of this is where your shifter goes through so this is right down in the bottom of the engine where a lot of dirt's going to get trapped in here you just want to make sure you don't have any dirt and grime all that stuff you can see the flaking in there all that stuff's bad you don't want that in there so we'll wipe most of it out and then i'll use some compressed air and it's nice and clean in there now so and same thing with this outer seal here you just want to wipe this down and get any dirt just make sure you have a nice smooth surface you don't want to see any nicks in there or anything that could potentially start weeping out oil so that's those two and that is the left case half which is the one that we labeled so these are the seals we're looking for We'll go find them in our new seals here. It should be that big one there, and I believe that one right next to it. So I always like to pull them out for a comparison, or you can even sometimes get a part number off them, or a size number, I should say. They're usually labeled the size of the seal. So that one is that guy, that one. Would appear to be this guy here so there are numbers that are on these that you can see because these aren't going to be individual like if you were going to buy them individually with a part number when you buy them in a kit like this they're all just thrown in there you don't know essentially which one which one is unless you read the old one this is why I never throw away my old parts until I replace them I typically don't throw any old parts away until the job is done um, sometimes the customer might want to see the old parts and sometimes you might need them for reference like this. Like if I would have just pulled this out and threw it away, now we're just guessing, you know, this way I don't have to guess. I can actually read the seal. 22, 6. So 6 is the width. T and T, 15, 15, 69. So that's the same one right there. So that's that guy, so now we got our seals. So there's the old ones and there's the new ones. This is your shifter, I think, that one that goes inside this case here. So for now, we'll just replace these ones because that's what we're working on. So the old ones will go back into the bag and then we'll do the same thing with these seals. We'll grease them. Like so. And then same steps, we're just going to slowly push on the edges and work its way around until it's flush with the case. See this one went in too deep there, so we can actually get underneath this and be very careful and kind of just barely pry it up. You don't want to damage the seal by doing that, so you just got to be really careful if you're going to pry that up. This has got a weird drop point in it. it keeps popping. 
So what I might do for this one is just get it seated and then use the seal driver. This will ensure that it sits evenly like that. So what was happening is I was pushing with my finger and it was reaching a sweet spot where it was just dropping right away. So to get it to seat evenly, the surface of this is bigger than the surface I'm pressing on so it bottoms out against it. That way it's nice and even. So that's what we want. And same thing with this one. Again, this is the shifter arm seal. This is what actually will move the detent inside and shift the transmission. So this one's important. This one usually collects some debris and this one can start weeping and leave oil all around the chain. So that one went in a little crooked. Again, you can see it's not sitting in there very evenly. So I'm just going to pry it up a little bit. And I might do the same thing. Except this time I'm going to take this off. I'm just going to use the edge and rest it on here. You can hear that loud clink. It means I'm seating against the case, so that's in as well. We'll do that other one too that I missed. This one right here. We'll use the screwdriver just to pry this out. This one doesn't have much of a press on it. And this is the actual arm for the clutch. This is what's going to activate the rod that pushes against the pressure plate. So the arm sits inside here. And this is the seal that protects any oil getting into the stator housing. So again, we're going to just lay this down. And that is a perfect match. Obviously, the rest of the seals we have are too big. So that is going to be the right one. Just making sure. 19, 12, 19. Yep. There's that. It's got a bearing in there. I like to usually put a little bit of lube in that right now. Since we're right here, because that's a blind bearing in a sense. So I'll just drop some assembly lube in there. And if you can get your finger in there, you can kind of move it around. But so as long as something's in there. Because we did spray some contact cleaner. So I don't want that being dry. There we go. Good to go. That side. Nice. Now we got this side, which I just wanted to confirm that one seal that came out of there because you saw when we first originally pulled that out, it was like this. Remember the lip was facing that way, I want to say. So I just want to make sure 100% that's the way that's supposed to be because I'm almost thinking it needs to go that way. but. Oops, we'll double check that real quick. So we're on RockyMountainATVMC.com um, and we're going into the OEM parts finder in the main menu and we're putting in your year make and model and basically they give you um, the parts layout of um, the entire bike. So that's telling me that this, like I was thinking originally, needs to go like this. And the reason that is, is because you have crankcase pressure. As this crank's coming down, it's pulling the piston down. It's pulling in the volume. The main compression of this motor takes place in the bottom end. There's two compression areas. One in the bottom end, it compresses the oil and fuel mixture, and then it boosts it through the transfer ports up into the top. And that's where the second compression takes place. When the piston comes up, it compresses that oil and fuel, and boom, there's your power. So with the pressure coming down, if this is facing in, it's going to spread this seal and expand it. It's gonna, the pressure is going to come in here, and it's going to tighten this up, if that makes sense. This is going to grab. Now, the way this was in here, if I look back at my book, I want to say that was like that. Is that your photo? Yeah, because we took a picture of this, remember, before we... Um, pulled it apart and sure enough you think that was in there backwards for real I think it was I'm, I'm really thinking it was I mean it doesn't make sense to me to put usually your numbers and stuff like this will always face towards you right so you think this might have been taken apart before yeah 
wouldn't surprise me just due to the age of it. You're talking about a bike that's, what, 18 years old now. Yeah. So it's it's had a long history. Um, it's very possible because usually when you replace a crank, you'll do the main bearings and the seals. Mm. It's just cheap insurance if you're going to go that far. You know, you took the time to split the cases and do the crank. What's an extra $40 probably for this bearing seal kit, you know, or whatever it costs. So in my opinion, I always do it. Anytime I do a two-stroke and I go into the bottom end, if I'm getting into the crank, I'll do the bearings and seals. It's just cheap insurance. That way I have a peace of mind knowing they're brand new. But yeah, um, we're going to look one more place real quick. I'm just going to see if I have, by chance, a factory manual for this. I'm going to lube this one. Do the same thing. My uh, little code when it comes to lubrication on bearings and seals is if you love it, lube it. <laughs> 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 so we're going to lube it. And we're going to push this in here like so. And that actually popped in really easily. So we're going to seat it down. I think it can go a little further. I'm actually going to grab my seal driver try the green one here that one's nice you always want something bigger than what you're pressing on this way you can hit on this case, uh, first. case first exactly because if it's the same size as the seal then it'll drive it into the bearing and we don't want that so this little bolt just holds that so it don't come off I want to make sure I'm not resting on our power valve here um, that's where the power valve goes in. See how it has that lift there? Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure I'm to the edge of that with the driver. You can see I'm not going to hit that. Right. And then we'll go ahead and see how it's solid now? How oh, you heard that? It's yep. seated. Now you can see it's actually down. Oh, that looks good now. Yeah. That's how it should have been when it came apart. So I'm pretty positive that seal was in backwards. Boom. So now we can uh, start the uh, assembly process here, I think. We got everything replaced. We got the main bearings in. We got all the seals in the case. They're all brand new. So I'll put this stuff away and we'll start putting when? it together. Let's figure out what side we want to build this. And I make that determination by looking at my center pieces here. And this case is pretty simple, straightforward, meaning uh, there's not some parts that are going to be hanging off, like filters or anything. I should be able to stack the transmission in, the shift drum, the forks, the pins, the crank, and this should pop right on, no problem. So I think, I think it'll be easier to set the drum in this roller bearing here versus trying to fit it into this. I could hit an edge here and crush this bearing, where this one's got a solid bearing ring. And that's going to be a lot easier to navigate and get on. So we're going to start with the mag side, or the magneto side. So this side will go like this. And we'll put that in there like that. Diagram of your entire transmission. It's going to show all the gears, all the shims, everything. So what we're going to do is re-insure that everything is there where it needs to be. Because when you pulled this out, you lost a couple gears off there, you know, so a gear could be flipped. Like this gear, for example, can go on either way. This gear has a bevel on one side, so it's very important that it either goes this way or this way. Now, because this is grooved like this, I'm going to say it goes in this way. And then uh, the washer here will go on like so. So this does have a washer on the end here, and on the adjacent side, it does not. So I'm only looking for one washer, and that's what we got. So I like that. That looks right. And then, so that all looks correct to me on that transmission. I'm going to check the main shaft. The main shaft is missing a collar or a ring. There's a... There's a shim right here, number 26. It's a one millimeter shim. It's a washer. Most transmissions will be shimmed in the case for clearance. And they'll have these outer shims right here that I'll pull off this uh, counter shaft. 
Um, so this has a shim here, here, and it actually has one here as well. And uh, we just pulled up a diagram just to confirm these shims and their sizes because when you pull these out of the motor, sometimes they stick to the bearing or they'll fall out and you'll miss them. Um, so you always want to make sure everything is there because when you put this together um, and you run it, you obviously want to make sure everything's shifting right and you don't want to tear this back apart. So Where do you buy one of these? Everyone, everyone could use one of these. Yeah, this is just your standard caliper. You could probably get these on. Uh, right now the battery's going dead on this, but um, this is just a blue point. Um, I got this from school actually when I graduated. I've had it for a while, but you can find them on Amazon or eBay. Um, just a veneer caliper. I call them very near because they're not really accurate. <laughs> um, they get you close enough though to measure it, but these are super handy. Like if you've got something you're working on, say I need a, a socket for this real quick, I can just come and grab it real quick and measure it and be like, boom, it's a 22 millimeter. And now I know which one to grab. So I'm not um. grabbing four, five, six sockets. So these are lifesavers, um, especially when measuring shims because these definitely have different thicknesses. This one's got a 40 thousandths thicker on this side and a 60 thou on the adjacent side so you want to make sure they're in the right spot and the only way you're going to know that is to measure it if you're going to try to eyeball that you'll never you'll never know some people have a good feel and they can feel that thickness but it's pretty pretty small to guess so i always like to measure is done i'm confident in your transmission that looks good so now we can drop that in so what i'm going to do is i'm going to throw some assembly lube in here just go around and get it in here. I'm going to put it in the shift drum or in the shift uh, dowels here, the fork pins, and also in this bearing here. I'm just going to make sure all that's in there. And I'm using a Torco assembly lube. Um, this stuff I build all my motors with. That's never done me wrong. Um, it's good for breaking in new builds. Um, you could probably run this one or two good motos and then flush the transmission fluid if you wanted to to get some of this out. It is thicker, so it does drag a little bit more, but I don't like to put in dry parts. I like to lubricate everything, you know, so um, you can always flush that out of there if you want, but if you left it in, it ain't going to hurt nothing. It's designed for, for engine braking and for building, so. But yeah, you can pick this up at... Um, I get it from a local shop down the road here, but I'm sure you can find this online. This is where the sprocket will be to drive. So we want to make sure that that end goes down. So that's this side here. And this is actually backwards. This needs to go this way. This is how this messes. Because once this side's in, this has a plane or a blind bearing. So I know the short end goes on into that. I had it this way laying on the table and that was incorrect. It's actually this way. So then we're going to, I like to grease these shims because when I'm putting the transmission in, it sticks and then the, the um, shim's not falling out. So I'll just grab a little bit of grease here and just grease them up. And push that against. And now basically if I hold this, see the shim's not falling out. So then you just want to grab it as an assembly and this should just drop right in to the housing. And you can make sure it sits all the way down. Right now it's getting caught up on. Yeah, well it slipped the gear. Sometimes the gears slip off, so then you have to just back up and try it again. Mm -hmm. I had it straight down, so I'll just tap this out and it'll come out of there and we'll give it a round two. So what we might have to do is we might be getting some resistance from this bearing. So I might just throw a little heat on it. In this case I'll use the heat gun again. I won't use the torch. We don't want to torch that bearing. So we're just going to use the heat gun to expand that bearing a little bit because I think it's grabbing on the shaft. Because it's, it's got a slip fit design, but it's pretty tight. Just throw a little heat and expand that bearing a little bit. And it should make it a lot easier to, to go in. Just expand this bearing a little bit on the center and allow this transmission to slide in a lot easier. 
try to angle this somewhat. Just to keep this from falling. I like that sound. It's definitely closer. I feel like this needs to drop down a little bit more. Typically, typically these are flush here. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm kind of looking for is to make sure there. Nice. Make sure that up close those are flush. You know, so that's how, see how that one sits a little taller? Mm -hmm. That's why that shim's there. Ah. So now if you look at this side, now it sticks out the way it's supposed to. Where right, it's going to go. Exactly. Nice. So now we got both of our shims in there where that's supposed to be. All that looks good. And that's gonna kinda lock up. That ain't just gonna spin free. See how it's binding? Mm -hmm. It's because the forks aren't holding the gears in the right spot yet. So once we put the drum in and the forks in, all that should fall right into play. So now we're gonna have to do the same thing with the crankshaft. The crankshaft is designed on this model to have a press fit. On a four stroke, it'll free float. But on a two stroke, you want press fit. So, we're going to have to heat that bearing up as well, put some assembly lube on it, and then drop that in. So you always want to make sure what side you got. This is the magneto side. So that's the side we're going to want to put in. So we're going to lay this down like this. And we're going to do just that. We're going to put the crank in next. Put this up. We have this beautiful crankshaft here. Take this bearing off here. Okay. This is a little cold, so it should have a pretty good slip in here, and this should drop in. So we just want to make sure we're lined up square, and then boom, just like that. Everything's rolling smooth. You want to make sure everything moves and there's no binding. And we haven't put any pressure on that bearing at all, so we know that's good. Our transmission feels good. Everything's sitting where it needs to be. That's what you want. So the next is the shift um, drum and forks. So we got these guys here, and then we also have two dowels here. So the dowels will go in like so. And those again, you shouldn't have to force these in. These should, in theory, just drop in and push in like that. So a lot of guys like to grease these as well, actually. It just helps, oops, helps if uh, taking it back apart. And it also helps just pushing it in there, making sure they're nice and lubed if you love it lube it yes exactly you gotta <laughs> lube it you can hear that a lot <laughs> so now these forks actually are going to be oriented specifically um most of the times they're labeled like this one's got a c on it one c this one's got a 2b and this one's got a 3d so these ones, usually the diameters are different too, so you can't mix them up for the most part. Um, so this one, like on uh, the Hondas, sometimes they're labeled L, C, and R, which means left, center, right. So it makes it a lot easier to figure out which one's which. In this case, this is the left side. That says 2B, 1C. I'm almost thinking that's the center. And then 2C3D, so it might be a little bit of a guessing game at this point. Let's just see which one fits in what. That one fits in there good. That's going to be the main one here. 
So I know for a fact this one goes here, and then the little pin lines up with your shift drum. So that's going to float in there for now like that. So now we got these two. Now this is where it can get tricky. These are definitely offset. You see how this one is centered and how this one is higher? Mm -hmm. So they may go in both ways, but there's definitely a, a certain way they go in. So we just got to make sure this one says 7E2B 21C. So there's no real classification, in my opinion, that says the difference, but there's definitely a diameter difference. So Suzuki made it easy for this model. They're all different sizes, so they can only typically go in one way. So this bigger one fits up in here. So it's probably gonna fit down in here too, but I'm feeling like this one goes up here and the smaller one's gonna go on the bottom. Because the smaller one it does fit in there actually. So it might be the opposite. The bigger one might go down first. Let's see if it fits in there. And it does. So I kind of like that like that, actually. Because that bigger one fits in there. It's got a nice fit. You can see it in there. And the same with this one. This will fit in there like that. That looks good. So that looks like the right way right there. So we're going to lube her. Because we love her. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. All right. Don't you ever forget that. You heard it here first. <laughs> so this will go in this way. This has the bolt that shifts in for the detent. So this goes in this way. You got to have this in here first and these all have to float. And then basically you're just going to lift them and put them in their corresponding holes. And then this is going to slide right through and lock them in. Same with this guy here. I'm going to lube that up. We're going to put that into the corresponding galley there for that shift drum. And then that should just drop right in real nice, like so. So now that sits in there real nice. So now we're ready for a gasket, and then we can put the case half on, and then the bottom end's pretty much done. That's it. It is, and it's going to have the top still on there, and we cut that away after. But I like to grease these completely. And I do this just because when you have to take this apart in the future, these pull right off. They don't stick and you're not scraping the surface with a razor blade. Um, you can really gouge up the gasket area um, by doing that if you're not careful. And this just makes it so much more convenient to pull it off there. If you ever have to get back in there or if you sell this and someone else has to build this, then uh, it makes their life a lot easier. So, just like that, that's pretty, pretty sealed up there, and then this will just basically drop right in there, like so. And then we can actually move it, and it'll stay in the position because we greased all this. So I can actually line up all the holes and make sure I'm not pinching the gasket when I go to put the case half on. So that looks really nice, like that. Right? Do you cut this after you press them together? Yeah, I'll put the case half on, we'll bolt it down, and then we'll check the transmission. And if all that checks, then I cut it. Because mm. if you cut it now, and then you have to pull this back apart, this kind of holds the gasket in place where it needs to be right now. And uh, it can f move and shift and just be a real pain if you don't... Uh, if you don't check that stuff so you always want to leave that on there you want to cut that last when you're absolutely sure everything's shifting properly and what we're going to want to heat all these bearings up it's just going to make this a lot easier um what i'm expecting is when i heat this up when i put this on just like the crankshaft and the transmission i want it to just slide in there i shouldn't have to beat on this thing or or force this on there you start forcing it something's not centered you're going to gouge dowels you might gouge the the press areas here so we just want to be um, very careful that we don't do that. So by heating this up, we're going to expand these bearings enough. Um, hopefully that, that just all slides on here. Okay. We're going to throw just some lube in here, and that's nice and hot, so that's going to just soak right into those bearings. All right, and then this is just going to drop right on here. We're going to set this on. We're going to line up 
the crank, the transmission, and those dowels. Just like that. And it's pretty much seated right now without having to do any beating on it or nothing. And then we're going to flip the whole motor because all of our bolts are on the adjacent side. And that's going to sit just like that. But you can see our seals engaging real nice. We want to make sure we didn't fold the lip on any of our seals. That looks good. Tranny feels nice already. Nice. So we'll go ahead and uh, we'll bolt this down. We'll shift through the transmission. We'll check that. And if that looks good, then we'll uh, we'll be uh, green light to pretty much do the final assembly on it. Cool. Hey, look at this guy. So what I look for is like the tiniest ones. The ones that have like no grime or dirt on the end like this one. Like see how this one's all dirty and stuff? Because these most likely... The ones that are on the inside. Exactly. These are the ones that are protected so they're not going to see the elements. See how they're sticking up about yay far? That's what you're looking for. You mm. want them to sit up. Um, you also just want to make sure that none of them have a washer. Some models carry washers and they'll hold oil from escaping. Hondas are, um, they'll have little triangles in most case pointing to the hole built in the case saying, hey, that's a specialty bowl and needs a washer or, mm. or something going on there. So, um, but yeah, those ones look like the shiniest ones and they fit in there real nice. So the rest should, in theory, just drop in. So now it's just a guessing game of dropping them in. That one looks a little longer, but we'll see if it, oh, that fit nice. Nice, all those fit in. And we got these smaller ones. These are typically around the top here. So if you sit there and you take like a cordless drill right now and you put an eight mil on there and you just, you don't know really what you're torquing down. So as I tighten this, I like to just ensure that a, these are screwing in nicely, you know, I'm not putting much resistance on that so that that's going down and that should do just that. So again, if you're buzzing these, you don't know, you know, until it's too late, then they snap or something and then you're in trouble. So what we'll do right now is we'll just seat a few of these. I'm pretty confident that we got this set up right, so I'm just going to go ahead and snug them all. If you're not sure, you can always just put two in and then check it. Mm -hmm. But we got this, so we're gonna take them all the way down. You know, see these cases, that's why they show that different K model, that when you're asking me K1, K2, K3, all that stuff. If you look at your case here, this has a setup for a, this would um, bolt in and basically um, tell you what gear position you're in. So. Like the Yamaha here has it. See how this is open and exposed? This has a little sensor that goes in there. I'll tell you what gear you're in? Yeah, so the motor knows if it's in neutral or in first, uh, whether the ignition has something to do with that. Um, in this case, this model doesn't have it, but the forging's there. So depending on Suzuki, they probably use this case for many makes, you know? So that's why the diagram probably asks, you know, the K1, K2, and so forth. So it's just different setup for different models. So we want to snug these down, and again, we're just, I'm using German torque, guten tight, guten tight. <laughs> so I'm just going to go through and just kind of quarter turn these by hand. And everything feels really nice. Nothing's binding or showing me a red flag that something's wrong. So there. So now your cases are together. And this moves nice. So another thing that I do is I'll center the crank. If you look right now, I feel like there's more of a gap to the left and the right of that crank case right now. Mm-hmm. Because again, we set the mag side down, we set that side. So I'm just gonna take a dead blow and lightly just tap this crank, um, just to center it a little bit. Something like that. 
now that we look at it, I think it looks a little more uniformed. Nice. Good to know. Good little tip. You know, so that's another thing too, is if you set it and you tighten it, the crank might feel like it's binding, like it's not spinning freely. And uh, you might just have to tap and jar it and center it a little bit. You don't really want to hit it too much because this was just built and precisionly trued and everything. So it's not, but we're not striking left and right. And we didn't um, beat the crank when we set it in here. Everything was heated up and pressed in real nice. So all we did was just lightly tap it just to center it a little bit is all so now what we're going to do is we're going to go through this transmission next thing i do is i check for transmission free play and the same thing you might just want to tap this shaft and that's just going to free everything up just in case and there should be a little bit of free play in these which i'm feeling which is nice so we're going to lay it back on its side here and we're going to bolt in our, uh, our detent here, and then we're gonna shift it with a T-handle and just make sure everything shifts fine. Uh oh I don't see my other little dowel. That's not gonna be good. Is this the dowel for, you? Yep, the shift, there it is, it's in there. But is there a spring? You might be missing a spring. I don't remember pulling a spring out. Okay. I watched videos and I pulled that out, I never saw a spring. Well, I'll tell you right now if there's if one or there's not. One look in the diagram. Let's pull this one out and see if there's one in there. Oh, I see. Got some kids hanging out by the fence here looking at the bikes. There is a spring. Mm. There it goes. Alright. So now we got that in there. So now we can check the transmission. So the next thing we need to do is we need to get this guy on there. So we don't want to lock tight this yet because if there's something wrong with the transmission, we want to take this back off, but usually you'll lock tight this. Um, so what we got to do is this has a notch on the back and it has a dowel that corresponds to the, the spot here where it's going to sit. So we got to make sure that that lines up because that's going to time everything. So we got to retract this, which usually you can just put a deal in here and move this back that way it gives you a free hand where you can come in here and actually set this because you want this to sit flush so i'm going to come in here and line that up and set it in just like so and i'm going to take this guy here and i'm going to thread this in just like that for now just like that and i believe this is a 12 mil it is so i'm going to need my other t-handle We'll tighten that up like that. So now, we'll set this up and we'll turn this so we can see it a little better. So now we're going to check the transmission. This is an important part because this is going to determine if we're going to move forward or not because you don't want to get the whole motor together and then all of a sudden your, your transmission doesn't shift. So right now it is in gear. You can see the counter shafts spinning on this side when I spin the clutch. So the counter shaft spins counterclockwise, which drives the sprocket forward, and the chain essentially is on this. So right now we're in gear, so what I want to do is I want to find neutral. That's the first thing I want to find. It's in gear, so that might be first there, and that might be neutral, which it is. So here's neutral, we're in neutral right now. So if we shift it down, if we turn this and we shift it down, it should be right there, that's, that's first gear. So it's spinning first gear. And then we're gonna go to neutral. Now it's not shifting the, see I can hold the counter shaft on the side and it's not moving. So now I'll go into second, that's second. Third, fourth, fifth. Nice. So we're good. So you always just want to quality control that, make sure you can shift through. And then I always leave it in neutral when building it, just because that's my pet peeve. So there it is. Nice. Now we pull that out and lock tight it. Yeah, we pull that out, lock tight that, and then go back and just 
torque down all of our eight mils on the adjacent side to seat the case all the way and then we can actually cut the gasket here now and uh, essentially your bottom ends together. So let's go through and tighten all these down like so and you want to do that and just double check everything again make sure everything's spinning freely and then once you actually put the motor in and run it I always do a quality control over the motor too and go back and just tighten everything again make sure everything's nice and tight. Yeah, this is actually really smooth. This thing's going together pretty nice. So again, I would just do a couple heat cycles, starting it up, let it warm up for a little bit, and then uh, just turning it off and watching, making sure there's nothing on your stand, you know, like anything dripping or anything like that. So take a blade and I basically just follow the surface here. And now we're, we're good to pull this because we, we know we don't have to pull the, the centers back off or apart, I should say. So we can cut this off and the other gasket will mesh against that too so it'll make a nice tight seal so if it's up a little bit it ain't gonna hurt you definitely want to try to get right to the surface without taking any of the surface away so then i'll find it to where it breaks and then i'll just jar it real quick take it off and we got some Red Loctite. You don't need a bunch. I just basically put about yay on there. And I'll go all the way down into first and then I'll just hold it against first and kind of just bump it like that and kick it back into neutral. Right there. So what I'm checking is this little roller right here. We put that shim behind here and I want to make sure it's centered. So it looks like it's riding right in the middle of where it needs to be. So always make sure there's always a bunch of little shims in these motors and they're very crucial that you get them in the right spot and they're doing the right thing. Cause if it starts dragging on something, that's where you get little metal flakes and they get in the bearing and the bearing goes out, you know, or something like that. So, but I think we got our seal in the right way. I think it was in backwards when you pulled it apart because that's the way it should be and yeah that's all in there so we can shove the d10 in there now and get that all bolted in at least and uh yeah let's get this thing uh, put back together you want to spring like that before remember i had to grab the one it was like jammed in there yeah you don't want that no and then see how these are offset mm -hmm. they can go in either way they can go in this way or they can go in the other way. I'm pretty sure it goes in this way because that's flush with this piece. But you can flip this. I can put this other one in there the wrong way just to show you it can be done. But what's going to happen is it'll bind in here. All of a sudden it won't shift or it won't move and you'll know. So this can go in like this. See how the bigger end well, this one's going to go in this way but this side i could put in this way see how the bigger piece could mm -hmm. go in mm -hmm. it could go in that way too but i'm not going to do that because that's not the way it goes so just make sure you're putting it in the right way boys and girls like that and then this whole housing presses in well, we got all the shifting detent in all that stuff's put back in you got this guy that goes on and you got this bearing that goes on so and we need to put the idler gear and the kickstarter gear this isn't timed on the Honda. Sometimes these are timed, so you just want to make sure that these aren't timed. This one's not. This basically goes in like so. This locks around like so. And then this comes all the way and snaps in like that. That's where it's free. So now we need to find your idler gear. So this can go two ways. It can either have the washer go first or it could all go second. I'll put this on here and see how it looks. 
here and then that. Goes on like that. Like so. And we have these empty bags. And then I grabbed this. And we got this guy. And this will press on like that. Boom. And it seals real nice. I gotta push the seal in a little more. See how the lips dragging past? It should be like that. It seats to the bearing. So that's actually got to go in just slightly. So I'm going to use this. That's sitting in there a lot better. I like that. See how the lips now riding. leave this loose because I can come back and torque that down but that's that and then this I'll have to check to see if this may have a washer or something that rides here want me to pull the diagram yeah I got to see what's going on here because this has to ride against something I'm wondering if that washer goes there and then this goes in five times. I'm going to get it over just a little bit more to match that crimp. Like use this to fold this tab over. Oh, those are supposed to be bent. Yes. So it doesn't come loose? Yep. Nice. So see how that spins freely? That's what you want. If you tighten this down, and this spins with this assembly, you're probably missing the shim behind the, per the inner hub. Mm. So this right now should all spin nice. Yep. And I should see how that's not moving, that's good. And then we can go ahead and we can torque this one down too. Loctite that bad boy. And then put the clutch on. We're gonna just reuse the stuff that we got. These are stamped, so I want to make sure they're directional. They got the sharp edge facing in, so we're going to make sure all the sharp edges face inward. They're all directional. Either the sharps go in or they go out. So basically, you're just going to take your thumb and feel for the sharp edge. Because these are all on like a big plate, and they get stamped from the factory, so they'll have a sharp edge. Mm. So just make sure they go in the same direction. So that goes like that. Now your little arm piece, I saw that right here. It's all by itself. So this looks nice and clean. It's gonna go in here. Boom. And that's where your cable attaches. 
So you just want to be careful with two when you're uh, tightening these down. You don't want to use a gun. You want to do this stuff by hand. And the reason is, is this is aluminum. You can strip this really easily. And these, this doesn't take much torque either. This I pretty much do by hand as well. So you don't have the actual service manual. I don't know what the torque spec is, but I bet you it's pretty light. It's probably about only 10 foot pounds at most. I'll tighten it in a crisscross pattern to seat it first. Before I take it all the way down, I'll go about halfway or like flush with the face of the pressure plate. And then I'll come back in and torque it all the way down. So again, I just go to about wrist tight on these. You shouldn't need much more than that. This has six bolts holding all this. Uh, so you can torque that down. And this is soft so it won't damage the steel part. So if you don't have a gear holder tool, you can always make something. I just cut this at the shop because I have access to machinery like that. But that just holds everything so now I can lock this bolt down. So this bolt's got to go to the right. So I'm going to rotate the engine all the way around until about there. And that'll hold that. Right, buzz that on real quick. Job. That you love it, you lube it. We love this gasket, so we're going to give it some attention. You just don't want it sticking to the case. We want an easy rebuild if needed in the future. So it looks like this is the way it goes. Oh. We got them two dowels. So I got that washer behind there. That's all good. We got a new seal here. That should be all good. Line this up. The old, old one. This is the new one. It looks like this thing is there. Just making sure uh, the O rings are not dry because we want that to be sealed in here. Take this out. We got, and these are directional too. This arrow. So you always want to make sure you refer to the manufacturer's instructions to get the correct. Don't just assume that it faces towards the exhaust. Usually it does. So then your rings, they also have typically a mark on these. Um, you want to look to see if there's any impression on the ring. Um, usually they'll have like a stamping, like a letter. Or or something there in this case there isn't any so I don't think the rings are these ones are probably multi-directional on this model but if they have like an A or a D or a number or something that always faces up and then you also have little dowels in between the piston that's where the rings connect fit between yeah mm. they float in there so first thing what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put the ring in and again I'm not seeing any marking on the ring to indicate that it would go up or down. So I'm just going to stick it in there and then take the piston and basically push it and use that as a guide. Like that. And then you then you measure the gap. Yep, and then it's got a gap right there and you got to use a feeler blade and that looks pretty small. Take a measurement. And we're gonna see. So we need to make the gap ten thou. Is that what you calculated? Yeah. So this is seven. Check it with the ten. This is where the math came out to. So and the ten is fitting in there. It's like right on the ten. So basically. I can get the 10 in there still. If you can see it, 
Um, you can see that the ring is, the, the gap is square too. You see how it's not angled? Mm -hmm. It looks pretty uniform, like parallel, yeah. the gap. That's what you're looking for. If it's too tight, then basically it'll angle itself. And if it's too far away, it'll do the same thing. It'll be out or it'll be pinching in. And this actually looks pretty good. I like it. I don't think we're going to have to modify anything, but you want to make sure you push the ring far enough down. You don't want to basically do this right at the top here and go, okay, I'm going to measure it right here because it's easy because the ring's never traveling this high. The ring sits quite lower, so you want to make sure you're in the travel path of the ring. And again, I'm using the new piston just to set it in there, make sure it's square, you know. That's the easiest way to square it, in my opinion. So again, we have another ring up here. We can check this one real quick, just to make sure. The other ring, because we don't want to assume. You know what assume spells, right? It makes a out of you and me. You know, sure does. So yeah, I can fit it in there. You can see it's going in there. So I'm going to say that's good for this application. They're going to wear a little bit too, so they're going to get bigger. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be just fine. Sweet. Well, that makes stuff a lot easier. So it looks like they were right. Is this a standard bore for this year? Should be. It's a little over. 2.6142. So it's 0.025. It's two and a half thousandths oversized. So it's like a B piston, which is good. It'll be fine. All right, well, I think we can put this on now. The biggest thing, we got that situated. Let's just double check. Correct. I actually like their setup. KTM's got a weird power valve. It's got like a horseshoe thing that rocks and turns like three. I just built one recently, so oh, I bet you there's an O-ring here too. That's probably that other one. Let's pull that off real quick since we're right here. Okay. Ooh, it's a good thing I pulled that one. See, it's all torn. Oh yeah, good catch. So that one's definitely jeopardized. That one's all pinched and damaged. So we'll go ahead and put the new one on there. Kind of thing? Yeah, so what this is is tension. Basically, you're tensioning it, controlling the power valve as far as RPMs go. The tighter you put this, I feel like the easier this is going to open up. It's like remapping the throttle. Yeah, I mean, you can twist this thing and then see how snappy that is now. Oh. Or you can release it. And it's all based off tension. Like right there is like barely... So you might have to mess with that. I almost like it right there. That feels... Once it's running, you kind of feel it what you want. Yeah, I mean, if you're noticing the top end is, like, not hitting hard enough or you want it more, you might be able to loosen this and screw it in. That all moves real nice and free, so that's what you want. But there's usually, like, a setting, like, the manual will tell you, you know, like, set this and maybe touch this off and then tighten this down. So there might be a technique to actually setting this that I'm not aware of just because every model is different. That's where the books usually come in like I see so yeah, this is gonna face towards the exhaust this arrow and typically that's how these pistons are set up I had a buddy build a CR250 and he put the piston in backwards and it ran it actually ran but it had like a bog and uh, sometimes you might have to clear them out you know on the two-stroke if there's like dirt and carbon in the pipe 
Um, so I went and cleared it out, and then the motor locked up. And we were like, well, what happened? And we ended up looking down the exhaust port, and when you look down, you could actually see these pins. If I put this piston in backwards, you can see the little dowel pins through uh. the port, and that's not good. You want to make sure, like if you look this way, um, down the intake side, where these pins are located, they travel right down the entire cylinder mm. they travel right here all the way down this i see and if they went to the other side they would get caught oh on their way back on up. their way back up uh, and they catch the ring and it, that's what locked up the deal I'll show that the two bridges can you show the piston too? Yeah, so they got the two dowels right there and right there. And they sit here and they uniform slide down this and this, making contact with the cylinder essentially at all times. Right. So they're That's always closed. Yeah. yeah. You don't want that gap opening and catching a deal there. So, um, and then another tall tail is usually the skirt is cut for the intake, um, in the intake side. Like this side's right here, see how it's cut? Mm -hmm. And that opens and closes that port. That allows as much fuel and air as possible to get into the motor. And we'll go ahead and get this on. Just gotta figure out which way it goes on here. It looks like a lot. She can't flip it that way. So it looks like it feeds in through that. And goes in just like that. Now, I don't know if some kits come with a um, sometimes, like I know the KTMs, they come with different thicknesses here, mm -hmm. and that can control your compression ratio. Really? Because if your cylinder's sitting higher, mm. then you got more of a gap. Mm. If it's sitting lower, you're tightening the combustion chamber. So, KTM really over the engineers there, two strokes are really cool. Um, they give you a bunch of options, fine tuning options. In this case, these, this model, they didn't have that probably back in this year. I'm talking more modern two strokes yeah. probably because that's what I built recently. This, I just put some assembly lube in here. Just to get that. A little on that bearing. So now I'm gonna have to put the clip in. This is where it can get a little tricky. So I'm gonna put the clip on the left side. That way when I feed the wrist pin in, I can feed it from the right. Mm. And I'm not dealing with this thing in my way. So the first thing I'm going to do is just that, is I'm going to put the first clip in before I even put it by the motor. And what I like to do is you don't want to have the gap in between this little notch right here. Like, you don't want it in between. I like to leave my gap, like, away from that notch. So I'll actually start the first side, like so, kind of hold it with my thumb. And I'll take like a flathead screwdriver and just kind of push the top in like that so it's in. I'm still holding my thumb here so it don't go flying out. And then I can just push it in with very gently like that so it clips in. So now the gap is way up here. It's not down here because if the gap gets in between here you can gouge in there. You can see... That went in there real nice. So that's good. So that's the first thing I do is I put that in first and then I'll lubricate everything here. The Torco assembly lube again. This in, I like to start the pin first and I'll push it against my thumb. That way it's right there at the edge so that when I drop this in, we're gonna make sure we're facing the right way. The arrow's facing towards the exhaust. It's the way we want it. And this goes in. And we're going to line up the pin, and then that should just push in by hand real nice. Like, see how that just went in with no effort? That's how it should be. So we're going to let that just teeter there for a minute. So now the next step. This is very crucial. This is going to save you from kicking and screaming. Basically, you're going to just tear a rag is what I do about halfway down. And I'm going to fold it right over this whole motor, like so. I'm going to tuck this around like this. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm putting in the last clip. If the last clip pops out of here and drops in my motor, 
that's not going to be good. <laughs> then you're going to be either tearing the cases apart. In some cases, you can pop a cover off and get into there. But I don't even want to risk it. So I always just put a rag over this. That way, if it does fall, it falls on the rag. It doesn't fall on the motor, and you're not grabbing a magnet or tipping the engine upside down, trying to shake it out of there and all that nonsense. So same principle on this side. I'm going to put the open end up. I'm going to put it in the groove. Oh, see, it fell out. That's exactly why I put the rag there. Let me make sure I wipe that off so there's no dirt on it. My hands are a little slick from the assembly lube. I might actually take these gloves off. It might be easier. So again, I'm going to grab this clip. And I want to face it so the gap is away from that hole. Like so. I'm going to start pushing that in. I'm going to take this little guy here. Now, you, there's another way you can do this so you can actually get behind this like this and push it up in there. And you just got to find the best way to get at this. It's kind of an awkward position. I'm going to put this in, say, like that. And the specialty tool would be nice to, to have, but we don't have that. So, again, I'm just going to... I'm going to have to get up a little higher on that, kind of push that in, oops. And you want to be careful not to score the side of the piston, you don't want to gouge that. So I'm trying to not do that. It's a lot harder on this side now because all the assembly lube's all over my hand. Oh, almost had it. Popped right off my finger. There it goes. And then just kind of push that tip in, like so. Nice. And it goes right in. And then you also want to make sure you have a little bit of free play with that wrist pin. You can kind of see it still moves back and forth ever so slightly. But now the gap is over here. It's right here actually on this side, but it's not in this little orifice right here. So I don't like it when the end of the clip is sitting in there again. Sometimes it can turn and it can pop out. I've seen that happen, so I don't even want to risk it. But that way, now it didn't nick the side of the piston or anything. And now we can take the rag out and... Now it's not in our motor, it's on the wrist pin, the way it should be. So cool. Typically, what I would do is uh, wash this with soap and water. But we have everything in this. And it doesn't look too dirty. Yeah, they, they machine this. You see they got porosity going on here. Which I brought this up to them, and they say it's not a problem. You see, like, the pitting in the cylinder? Mm-hmm. There you go, up in here. So basically, when you weld onto this, sometimes you get little voids. And uh, in this case, that's not going to hurt this. If anything, that's just going to retain more oil in those holes. Um, so in some cases, these guys claim that that's actually better. Yeah, so in this case, I'm just going to lubricate the cylinder wall with that Torco. I'm going to put a little bit all in there, and I'm also going to put it inside the ring gland and kind of put some on the piston. That way, you don't have any sort of dry seizure at all when you're going to kick this thing over for the first time. You mm -hmm. don't want that thing all dry on dry. It's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. I'm dump some of this in there. I got too crazy with it, but... It around. Kind of do the same thing here. Jeez. Mustang. Classic. Classic garbage. <laughs> I don't mind Mustangs. The new ones are cool. Yeah, the brand new ones are crazy looking. Yeah. So are the Corvettes. The new Corvette. You like that? Yeah, I do. I actually want to double check, double, triple, double, double, triple check that there's no markings on this ring. Again, there'll be little scribe marks, and they're usually right by the gap. They're like right up in here. There'll be a marking, and typically those go up. Since this doesn't have a marking, and I'm just going to push this right around until it drops into its home. And I'm going to go down to the second one. And then 
my dowels are on the intake side here, so that's the first dowel there. So the first one's usually the hardest one to get on because I dropped that one on first. You gotta stretch it over the first one. And on the second one, we can just start right at this dowel pin right here. And then you just follow with your thumb right around the piston. Boom. Nice. That's exciting. So then you have your, when you compress this, you just want to make sure everything, here's your two pinholes, so we're good. So then there's a little trick I use when I put the cylinders on. I'll start with the back end of the skirt, this side here, because this is my intake side, and I'll push it up against the piston like so, and I'll push my thumbs on the sides and that'll slide right over. And we'll line that up. And then this drops right on. I like the look of that. And then we can wipe all this off. Like that. I like that. Nice and brand new, huh? Mm -hmm. Looks like one of my motors over there. Mm -hmm. Starting to blend in with the status quo in this garage. Yeah. You got the uh, Kickstarter here, right? Yeah. Let's see that real quick. Yeah, pretty much is if you just hold the rings right. And you just want to be careful. You don't want to pinch those rings. If that doesn't slide on nice, there's an issue. So don't force the issue. You just want to make sure it all goes on there nice and the way it's supposed to. I don't see washers here. Sometimes these take washers. They didn't have any, I remember. Yeah, so those will go on. We'll just snug those, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick the motor over by hand with the Kickstarter just to make sure the piston travels freely and there's nothing binding up. That should, at this point, kick right over, no problem. So that's nice. Goes all the way down, exposing the exhaust port all the way. And it comes all the way up, no problem. So then I'll look down the exhaust bridge here, port, I should say. And just make sure everything looks okay there. And again, we can't see those pinholes. If you can see the pinholes, that's a dead giveaway. Your piston's in backwards, so. Um, can you crank that over so we can see? Oh. Uh, cool. That's satisfying. Yeah, so when it comes down, you can actually see the entire way this goes. See, it opens the intake port here. So the cylinder fills all up, and it's pushing the oil and fuel down right now. So everything's down in the bottom end. Like, this is the exhaust stroke right now. All the exhaust gases are leaving. So now as it comes up, the boost ports right here are transferring all the fuel and fuel mixture and you see how the exhaust port's still open when uh -huh. it does that uh -huh. so the harmonics are now fighting to keep that all in there they're back pressuring in so it's pretty cool all that timing and everything it's crazy there. you need to bring two strokes back fuel injected two strokes are now coming out really new ktms and husqvarna's are fuel injected and they're mean and then they just released the first turbocharged two-stroke motor. In like a street bike or something? Uh, I think it is in a street bike. Uh, my boss showed me an article on it. Transmissions in neutral still has got nice, nice play there. We'll take this back off. We shouldn't need that for a minute. Put this back on so you don't lose it. That was probably your Kickstarter bolt because it goes in there. So now I just want to make sure this power valve all connects. So there might be just some timing stuff there. You'll have to refer to an owner's manual for that. But uh, I bet you it'll be just fine. So now we would torque these down. Usually you'd use crow's foot. And you lock onto them and torque them. They're like little, you know what the crow's feet are? They're basically like ends like this, but they have the socket opening for like a quarter inch or three eighths for like a socket. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you yeah. Can put them in there and you can actually torque internal pieces like that but honestly for this stuff you just need to give it a hardy torque down and i go in a cross pattern just like a tire on a car start here 
start here. So I go up. That'll just set it for now. So that's like your half torque. You usually want to go in half torque increments. So if the final torque was like 32 foot pounds, I would do 20 first, seat it, and then go to 32 and torque it all the way down. Mm -hmm. Plug looks good still. I'd just reuse that. You know how to check your plug, make sure. That's the one thing you want to check when you tune these two strokes in. You want to make sure they're not dark crazy or they're too white. Dark would indicate a rich mixture. You know, too much oil and gas getting in there. Um, white's getting too hot. It's burning too hot, so it's leaned too much, um, which could all be jetting related. Um, you want to make sure it just has a nice white filament on the end here and it's not all burnt up and this is showing it's actually running pretty good so if this was in a running motor um i would leave the jetting where you have it but i would always refer to your owner's manual when you go through the carburetor um like on those carbs i'll write down all the jet sizes that way i know if it's running bad i already have a you know i'm not basing it off memory i think it, this was in there and that was in there um, so you just got to make sure you know what jets you have and what carburetor you have. You're either going to have a Makuni or a Keenan, um, and they both take different jets. So depending on what year it is, because manufacturers will switch them all the time, you know. They were running Showa for the longest time, then they switched to KYB on suspension, and everyone loves it. And then they'll go back to Showa after a few years and say they love it. And it's just a back and forth game. Or you can just buy the Electron, then you don't have to worry about any jets. That'd be cool on this model, too. You should reach out to those guys. So we'll put a little dab here. Nothing crazy. Put this in. I'm going to take all the play out of this, basically. I'm going to move this to just where it starts to hit this. Uh, this is where that special tool they're going to want comes into play. Um, I just want to make sure it's not being held open. You don't want the exhaust to be held open. So right there looks good. So these are just a slight snug on here. And this one was down here. Make sure this thing's not directional. I don't see it being. It's got a nick down here, so I'm assuming that's going to go down by the pipe. Sometimes they'll say up or direction. I'm not seeing one on this. I guess we can check the reeds while we're here, too. Do we check those at all? Nope. Basically controls all the pressure. kind of condition they're in. Well, it's a good thing we pulled this off because there's not even a gas cup. And you're screwed. Is it broken? Yep. Dang. Let me see that up close. I wonder if that's what locked up his mo the motor. Did that bust it and then it flew in the engine? It's possible. It looks like debris flew in though and cracked that, but yeah, you're going to have to buy these pieces. Mm -hmm. And then you want to make sure they close all the way. Um, in this case, it's redundant, but I can see air gap through the reed. But these are broke. <laughs> you just going to 20 at first? 10. I'm probably just going to do these four, honestly, because you're going to replace that one. Right. All right. Motors as far as we can go. We got to get a new bolt for the head. We got to get new reeds. Other than that, Joe, I mean, what do you think as far as dropping it back in? 
Um, yeah, just the uh, the reeds, they were cracked. And then you just need a couple of the uh, the nuts for the top, two of those. You have the other washer. Nuts, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, other than that, it should be good. You might need a clutch. I doubt it, though. It looked all right, so just need to put it in, break it in, and go riding. That's the last step. Cool. It's, if anyone needs to reach out to you if they have questions or want work done if they're in the Phoenix Valley, is there anything, what information do you need from them other than what kind of bike it is, what's the problem? Is there anything specific that they should send you? Um, just always year, make, and model. Um, the dirt bike stuff I typically specialize in, so right now that's pretty much what I do. Um, but yeah, just a year, make, and model, and you can always reach me at email. Um, jbutis at yahoo.com is my uh, personal email you can reach out to, and uh, I can at least point you in the right direction or see what my availability is and go from there. Cool. Awesome. Well, huge thank you to Joe. Joe, thank you. I'm so stoked to have this motor done this fast in two days. Um, we did it and we took our time and I learned so much. I'm overwhelmed. I'm sure you guys are. So now it's time to kind of sit back and think about this and then you can reference this video if you had to build something like this. So uh, yeah, I'll have all the information in the description to Joe as well as on the screen that you saw and check out the playlist on the screen right now to see all the other ARM 250 stuff. And now we have a ton of parts sitting on the shelf to put this on once we have it running. So now we get work on suspension, we got plastics, graphics, all that coming. So stay tuned. See you guys then.